Hello again. So having gone through the story of God's love in the Bible and uh, having thought a little bit about what the gospel is and how we respond to it, now's a good time for us to think about the subject of conversion, Christian conversion. And maybe I should start by telling my own conversion story. I was raised in a church-going family. I was born in inner city Leicester in the UK, and uh, my early years were spent on a street that looked quite a bit like Coronation Street. Um, I uh, was taken to church um, every week, and uh, my parents uh, read Bible stories to me and prayed with me. I learned Christian hymns, and Christianity was the ethos that I grew up in. And I never really rebelled against that. But I have to say that it wasn't really a personal experience for me. It was about participating in an institution. And uh, I didn't dislike that. But God was not a personal friend for me. I, would, I never thought in terms of a personal relationship with God or experienced my faith in any, uh, anything like that. Um, when I was quite young, my dad was ordained as a minister in the Church of England. And so then life changed for me a little bit because I became a preacher's kid. And there are some good things about that and there are some hard things about that. And I'm sure I don't need to go into great detail about that. When I was um, about uh, 11 or 12 years old, um, my parents suggested to me that it might be a good time to get confirmed. So... Um, that was fine with me, so I went through confirmation classes. I don't remember anything about the confirmation classes, except for A, that it was a very big group of people. I, I think there would, be, would have been over 20 young people in the confirmation class. And B, there was an older girl in the class who was about five years older than me, and she really uh, knew Christ in a personal way. I could tell that there was something different about the way that she was experiencing her Christianity. Very, very different from mine. I was curious about that. Not curious enough to ask her about it, but I was curious. My dad, from time to time, would pass religious books to me, uh, Christian books, um, so that he could, because uh, he knew a lot I liked to read, and uh, I, I guess he hoped that um, something would catch, something would catch my attention, and that um, I would be interested to pursue the subject further. I didn't usually read the books very much. I might have read the first few pages and then made some intelligent comment, some quasi-intelligent comment, as he passed them off, as I passed them back. But they didn't really catch my attention very much. But um, early in my thirteenth year, Dad passed me a Christian book, which did catch my attention. It was called Nine O'clock in the Morning by Dennis Bennett. Dennis Bennett was one of the very first. Episcopal clergy in the, in the United States to get involved in what later became known as the charismatic movement, a Pentecostal type movement within mainline denominations. So ben, Dennis Bennett told the story from the beginning of how he had known nothing about it, but then how he had had an experience of what he called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, uh, an overpowering experience of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and, and begun to experience miraculous happenings in his life and things like that. And I have to say, this really got my attention. Nothing in it was anything like what I had experienced so far in the Christian life. Dennis was talking about a real God who did real things in the real lives of real people. And uh, I was hooked. And I remember f finishing that book. I read it very quickly in one night. I remember finishing that book and thinking, wow, if God is like that, then I need to know how I can get to know that God. Now, our confirmation class, to come back to that for a minute, had sort of stayed together for a while after we were confirmed as a youth group. We used to meet on Sunday nights after the evening service, because in those days, a lot of churches had evening services as well as morning ones, and we did. So we would meet together for a youth group meeting after the evening service, and my, my dad, who was the vicar of the church, would usually lead that meeting, the discussion time. And gradually it got smaller and smaller and smaller. And... Uh, one night, 
It was March the 5th, 1972. Uh, there were actually only two who attended the meeting. I was one, and the other was the older girl that I told you about, who uh, was really experiencing her faith in a much more alive kind of way. I have no memory at all of uh, what the discussion topic was that night. What I do remember is that at a certain point, my dad turned to me and said, you've never given your life to Jesus, have you? And when I think about that now, I think, wow, if I said that to one of my kids in public, they would be really embarrassed. But I wasn't embarrassed for some reason. Maybe because, without knowing it, he had given me the piece of the jigsaw puzzle that I was missing. Because my question had been, after I finished reading 9 o'clock in the morning, my question had been, what's the next step? How can I get to know this God for myself? And Dad had given me that information. So after the meeting was over, I went to my room, sat down on the bed and prayed a prayer. A very simple prayer, just in those kinds of terms. I don't remember the exact words, but it would have been in, the, uh, in, in terms of giving my life to Jesus. It wasn't a dramatic experience. It wasn't a mystical experience. I didn't have any strong sense of the presence of God or anything like that. But I did know that something significant had happened. And things began to change. God became the center of my life. Uh, learning to read the Bible, learning to pray, reading Christian books, getting involved in um, trying to reach other people for Christ and everything, very quickly became the central passion of my life. I discovered something amazing, something wonderful, which was giving me a joy uh, which I hadn't really found before. Very, very quickly after that, uh, my dad gave me a little book teaching me how to have a daily time of prayer and Bible reading. Um, and so uh, I started doing that. And uh, that became a very important part of my life as well. So that's what I think of as being my Christian conversion experience. I was 13 years old, so very young. Um, but it's made a huge difference. It's been the foundation of everything that I've done in terms of ministry ever since then. So, what is conversion? Let me read to you from the first chapter of Mark's Gospel. After John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed alongside the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew. They were fishermen. So they were throwing nets into they were throwing fishing nets into the sea. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat, preparing the fishing nets. At that very moment he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. So this is one of the simplest accounts in the Bible of the relationship between the gospel, conversion, and evangelism. The word gospel, as we said, means good news. So we read that Jesus comes into Galilee announcing God's good news. What is the content of that good news? Now is the time, here comes God's kingdom. Remember we said that that's one aspect of the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of God. So that's the gospel. Then comes conversion. What do people have to do? Repent, says the old Bible. Change your hearts and lives, says this common English Bible, and trust this good news. So people turn away from an old way of life and put their trust in Jesus and his gospel. That's conversion. And then a bit later on, Jesus tells people, come, follow me, and I'll show you how to fish for people. That's evangelism. He had fished for them. And now they were fishing for other people. So you might say conversion comes when we, when the gospel becomes real to us, when the gospel grabs our attention, when we understand it in a way that we haven't before, and we make a response to it by changing our hearts and lives, putting our faith in Christ, and beginning to live with God at the centre of our lives. And that's very often followed by a desire to share that with others as well. I will teach you the fish for people, Jesus says. 
Conversion stories come in all shapes and sizes. There's no one paradigm that works for everybody. Perhaps one of the most famous Anglicans of the 20th century was C.S. Lewis, the famous writer. C.S. Lewis' conversion story was very intellectual. He had been brought up in a church-going family, but had become an atheist in his youth. And for several years, he lived as an atheist. But he began to have experiences that his atheism could not explain. He called those experiences experiences of joy. And what he meant by that was a longing for something which, were, which appeared to be unattainable. And yet the experience of that longing was just such a source of joy and excitement to him, even though the, the longing could not be fulfilled in any way that, that was obvious to him. And he wondered, like, how does that make sense? If there is nothing more than this, this physical universe that we live in, then how is it that I find in myself this longing that is not satisfied by anything in this physical universe? And yet having the longing is a joyful experience for me. So he tried to uh, understand that. And he had a philosophical kind of mind. And so he read lots of philosophers and examined lots of arguments and eventually he called himself a reluctant convert. In 1929, he came to accept the existence of God. And a couple of years later, uh, moved on from just theism to faith in Jesus, in Christianity. But it was all by an intellectual process, trying to understand and analyse an experience that he was having in a philosophical sort of way. Not that it was not thorough, but, that it, but thinking played a very, very you know, uh, important part in his conversion. Uh, that's not a common story nowadays, although I can think of at least one person in my own congregation who came to faith in Jesus in a very intellectual way like that, thinking through the arguments for the existence of God and for the truth of Christianity, being persuaded by them and committing himself to Christ as a result of that. I think about my dad's story as another example, like me. My dad was raised in a church-going family, was a life -going, uh, life, lo a lifelong churchgoer. Uh, when he was young, he was a, a choir boy. He always loved to sing. But uh, again, like me, no, not a sense of personal connection with Christ. But when he was a young man, still living at home, but, but out in the working world, um, a, a man called Leslie Sutton, a layman, came to their church, St Barnabas Church in Leicester, uh, in Holy Week. So that's the few days before Easter, you know, the week before Easter. And a Holy Week mission was what they were having. And Leslie Sutton was speaking at the services every day in Holy Week. And Dad went. Uh, his father, my grandfather, took him to the daily services. And something about Leslie's message touched Dad in a way that he had never been touched before. And it was like the gospel story that he had heard many times um, some, somehow reached out to him and w went into his heart. And he felt a sense of connection to Christ and made a commitment to him in the context of those Holy Week services. So that's another way. My wife will tell you, Marcy will tell you, that she never remembers a time when God wasn't real to her that she prayed in a, in a mystical sort of way um, all her life and has always been part of the church community. When she was a teenager she made a decision about which church she wanted to be a part of. She had been raised in the Anglican Church and then spent some time in the United Church um, but she sort of went around and tried different kinds of congregations and she liked the way the Anglican Church had prayers of intercession on Sunday morning which weren't just for small local things but reached out to suffering people all over the world and so she made a decision to continue to be a part of the Anglican Church and to be confirmed there. I have another friend, a parishioner of mine in a previous parish who started attending church, had never been baptised started attending church in a time of great need in his life when he had lost a job and when he had lost a marriage and everything seemed to be coming apart. He had a very close friend who was a member of our church and so one day he just kind of showed up in church. I was leading the service but there was a guest preacher and the guest preacher was preaching 
uh, about the passage in scripture which talks about the lost sheep and the lost coin and how the good shepherd went out to find the lost sheep and brought it home and he said to me weeks later he said that's how I felt that Sunday I felt like I was a lost sheep and God had come out to reach me and bring me home so he found Christ in the context of that tiny little rural church the Christian community as a lost sheep being brought home by the good shepherd think about Archbishop Anthony Bloom who uh, was uh, again like C.S. Lewis and as a young man he was an atheist he was a Russian emigre in Paris um, during the Second World War he was training as a doctor um, and and saw himself as an atheist and uh, when he was a university student there in Paris he was invited to a student meeting and a priest was speaking at that meeting and the priest was speaking about Christianity and Anthony Bloom talked about how as he listened to the priest he got angrier and angrier and angrier because he didn't really like what the priest was saying but in intellectual honesty he had to admit that it would be probably responsible for him to investigate and to see if it was true so when he went when he went home he went to his room and opened uh, a new testament and uh, counted the gospel the chapters in the gospels to see which gospel was the shortest one and found that the gospel of mark was the shortest one and so he began to read in the gospel of mark and as he described it he said that he didn't get much further than the first chapter because as he was reading there suddenly came an awareness to him he felt very much as if there was somebody in the room with him in fact somebody was standing across the other side of the desk from him it was not a person that he could see he did not see a vision but he did feel a very strong sense of a presence in the room and he knew instinctively that that presence was the presence of Christ and he said later that when he began reading about the resurrection he had no difficulty at all accepting it because he had already met the risen Christ so in Anthony Bloom's case it wasn't an intellectual process of being argued into Christianity he had started that way but very quickly it had become a mystical experience of the presence of the risen Christ with him in the room amazing stories eh? all these stories are different it seems as if the Holy Spirit takes great delight in writing unique conversion stories now one of the problems we have in understanding this process today is that the New, the New Testament was for the most part written by the first generation of Christians so most of the people in the New Testament were people who had become Christians as adults they had heard the gospel either from Jesus or from the Apostles or whoever they had heard the gospel and they had believed it they'd come to believe it and they'd responded to it by putting their faith in Jesus and being baptized so they had had what you might call a darkness to light conversion experience some of them it was a very quick experience some of them more of a process but in each case it was they were they were making an adult decision to become Christians there's very very little in the New Testament about what it would be like to grow up in a Christian home where one's parents were Christian and where you were exposed to the teaching of the gospel and the Christian faith as a child and gradually came to the process of owning that faith for yourself the New Testament doesn't have much to say about that it is however a common problem in the Old Testament where we have this phrase you know the God of your father Abraham and Isaac and stuff like that and it's not always easy for the faith to be passed down from one generation to another sometimes it takes and sometimes it doesn't I love the story of the patriarch Jacob in the book of Genesis Jacob is the uh, son of Isaac who is the son of Abraham so Jacob is like the third generation uh, of those who were called from Haran to move to Canaan to be the ancestors of God's people Israel uh, but you know in the early part of the story of Jacob you know it's obvious that God is not personal to him he talks about God as being the God of his father Abraham and the God of Isaac but he's not his God yet Jacob gets into trouble he has a squabble with his brother and he has to run away across the desert back to Haran so that he can be safe and on the way he has his first ever encounter with God this is what happens Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran he reached a certain place and spent the night there when the Sun had set he took one of the stones at that place and put it near his head 
Then he lay down there. He dreamed and saw a raised staircase, its foundation on earth and its top touching the sky, and God's messengers were ascending and descending on it. Suddenly the Lord was standing on it and saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will become like the dust of the earth. You'll spread out to the west, east, north and south. Every family of earth will be blessed because of you and your descendants. I am with you now. I will protect you everywhere you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done everything that I've promised you. When Jacob woke from his sleep, he thought to himself, The Lord is definitely in this place, but I didn't know it. He was terrified and thought, This sacred place is awesome. It's none other than God's house and the entrance to heaven. After Jacob got up early in the morning, he took the stone that he had put near his head, set it up as a sacred pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. He named that sacred place Bethel, though Luz was the city's original name. Jacob made a solemn promise. If God is with me and protects me on this trip I'm taking, and gives me bread to eat and clothes to wear, and I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I've set up as a sacred pillar will be God's house, and of everything you give me, I will give a tenth back to you. I think that's such a funny story, such an amazing story. Obviously, Jacob is really amazed. You know, he's heard his father and his grandfather tell stories about encounters with God, but he's never experienced it himself. And now for the first time in his life, he has this en 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 encounter with the living God. Mind you, he's not ready to change his ways yet. He thinks he can strike a bargain with God. And so he says, if you do this for me, and if you do this for me, and if you do this for me, then I'll make you, you know, my God, and I'll give you tithes. Like, you know, God, you should be glad to get, the, get a, a, fate, a servant like me. So he's still got a lot to learn. It's a much more gradual sort of process for him. That's the way it is often for people who are you know, raised in households of faith. It's not, it's often a long process to own it for yourself so that it becomes real to you. So it's not just second-hand knowledge. So as I've reflected on these different kinds of conversion experiences, I've come to see that there are two kinds of faith story. You might describe them both as stories in three chapters, but they're different kinds of stories. The first kind is what you might call a classic conversion story, darkness to light. So the three chapters are chapter one, my life before Christ, what it was like. Chapter two, how I came to faith and discipleship, the process by which I came to make a Christian commitment. And chapter three, the difference it's making to me today to be a follower of Jesus. How is my life different because I follow Jesus? So my life before Christ, how I, I uh, made that commitment of faith and discipleship and what difference it's making to me today. So that uh, sort of story works for many folks in evangelical churches where they have a strong sense of like a sinner's prayer, committing your life to Christ. It also works for um, non-evangelical adult converts like C.S. Lewis, who like that had a sort of a, a long period before Christ when he was an atheist and then a sort of an intellectual, dr intellectually driven conversion story and then gradually learning to live that out in his daily life. But of course, it doesn't doesn't work for everybody. So the second kind of story is the sort of what you might call the story of those of us who were raised in Christian homes, who came to own the faith for ourselves and make it our own, not just our parents' story. And so our three chapters might be number one, my upbringing in the church community, the various faith influences on my life. Chapter two, how Christ became personal for me how my parents' Jesus became my Jesus. And then again, chapter three, the difference that's making for me today that I'm a follower of Jesus. As I think about it, I see that mine is a bit of a combination of both. And, you know, I wonder, you might like to think about your story and say, like, which of those two kinds of stories does yours fit into um, more smoothly, more easily? In the second half of the 20th century, perhaps the most famous evangelist in the world was Billy Graham. Billy was a mass stadium evangelist. So he would get crowds together, thousands of people in the stadiums, and he would give simple 
powerful preaching, which you might describe as preaching for a verdict. His goal in all of his preaching was to motivate people to want to get out of their seats and walk down to the front at the end of the service and talk with a counsellor and pray a prayer of commitment to Christ and then receive materials to get them started as a follower of Jesus and to help them connect with the church. I think it's true. It's fair to say that the Christian world had a love-hate relationship with Billy Graham. Most evangelical Christians loved him. Many mainline Christians did not. But very few have reflected on how easy Billy Graham's job was compared to the job of an evangelist today. Billy lived in the days of Christendom. He could assume that there was a Christian framework, a basic biblical knowledge that everybody shared, even if they were not Christians themselves. He could use words like God, Jesus, cross, resurrection, salvation, heaven, and know that everybody was working from the same dictionary. People understood what those words meant. People knew the stories of the Bible. The one thing that Billy needed to teach people, and he tried to do it pretty well every time in his sermons, was he needed to teach them that they were not saved by being good, but they were saved by trusting Christ. Nowadays, in 2020, we have to start much further back. We are in the third generation, or maybe the fourth generation, of biblical illiteracy. Most people, even people in the church, are not very familiar with the, with the story of the Bible and with the individual stories in the Bible. Nowadays, in, in uh, public conversation, if you say the word God to six people, you'll get six different meanings for that word. And when it comes to questions of right and wrong, questions of life after death, questions of the divinity of Christ, whether Christ is in some sense God, people are going to be all over the map. And this means that a darkness to light conversion today will take longer. It'll be more like a journey of discovery and learning. My friend John Bowen introduced me to the idea of a response grid. I've kind of adapted it a little book, a little bit. So imagine a line from zero to 100. And on the one side, zero, you might say, let's imagine that zero is an atheist who has no interest in, in God or in Christianity, no interest in trying to live a Christian lifestyle or anything like that. Let's imagine that 100 is a, a fully convinced Christian disciple who is living as close to perfection as you can possibly imagine. Now, my guess is that nobody watching this video is at either zero or 100. We're all somewhere from one to 99. Imagine that 30 is the point where a person says, well, you know, um, I don't understand everything yet, but I understand enough to know that Jesus is the key to knowing God. And so I'm going to put my life in Jesus' hands and ask him to help me to know God and follow him. Before that point, so from 1 to 29, we could call a person a seeker. And a seeker, you know, they've got all kinds of questions. Is there a God or gods? Or did the universe come about in some other way? Uh, what is God like? Who is Jesus? Is he just a human being? Or is he somehow, in some sense, is he the son of God? Or in some sense, God? Or, or what? What is, the, what is the significance of him? Why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, all kinds of questions that people will be working through. And maybe not all of them will be intellectual questions. Maybe the people have had bad experiences of church in the past that have scarred them and they need help processing that and coming to some, some kind of terms with it and so on. But eventually, if all goes well, the person will get to the point where they say, yeah, I still have lots of questions, but I know enough to know that Jesus is the key to knowing God. So I'm going to commit my life into his hands and ask him to help me to know God. So now they're at 31 and they're on the way to 99 and they have a whole different set of questions. Still have some of the old ones too, but they got some new ones like, you know, how can I read the Bible in a way that it makes sense to me now that I'm a follower of Jesus? How can I pray and have a sense that I'm connecting with God? Okay, so I'm a follower of Jesus. What does that mean when I go to work? How will I live differently at work? How will I do business differently if I'm a business person? What about my leisure time? What about how I live in my home and in my family? What about how I treat the poor 
and needy? What about my political convictions? Well, every aspect of our lives we'll be thinking through what it means to us now as a follower of Jesus to be faithful to him, to learn to love God with all our heart and love our neighbour as ourselves in, the, in every area of our lives. I was once teaching a Christian basics course in uh, Fort Vermilion and it, I re uh, it was a, I think it was a Friday night and an all day Saturday course so I was staying in Fort Vermilion for the weekend and there were a group of I think about 15 people that were taking this course and one of them was a visitor to the community he was from Scotland his sister was living in Fort Vermilion and she attended the Anika church there and so although he wasn't a Christian he came along to the course and he said at, at the beginning he said to me I'm not a Christian but you know I like my sister and this is important to her so I thought I'd come along because I'm curious is that okay yes it is said I so he he attended and he really enjoyed it and we enjoyed him and uh, at the end uh, he said to me I want you to know that this has been a really helpful weekend for me he said I'm not at 30 yet but I'm a lot closer to it than I was at the beginning of the weekend I thought that was good that was he was being honest he was moving forward but he still had some learning to do some discussing to do before he could um, call himself a Christian um, I remember a mother and daughter who were baptized in my church once and we were talking about the response grid and I asked them you know where are you on this grid and the mother said 29 and after my baptism I'll be at 31 Oh, yeah, she understands what baptism is all about as an adult. It's that moment of putting your trust in Christ, putting your life in Christ's hands. I have another friend who used to be an atheist. Now he says he's not an atheist, he's an agnostic because he's realised that he, he can't be dogmatically certain about his atheism. I think, well, he's moving in, in that direction. So what we're trying to do as evangelists is to invite people to move further along and give them the help that they need to take the next step, whatever it might be. So as we come to the end of this particular session, as we're thinking about the subject of conversion, why not reflect on your own conversion story? How did Christ become real for you? Were you raised in a church family? Did it take for you right away? Or was there a process that you went through in order for Christ to become alive for you in your own experience? Or were you raised completely outside of a faith environment or in another faith even? And uh, there was a process by which you encountered the Christian message and the gospel and it grabbed your attention, just like Moses having his attention grabbed by a burning bush. Something grabbed your attention and uh, motivated you to want to learn more. And so you came to know Christ. Think about that and maybe try to write down your conversion story. Maybe use one of those three chapter paradigms, either the darkness to light or the gradual sort of adoption of the parents' faith or things like that, and uh, see which one works best for you. All right, that's, that's all for me this time. Take care, God bless, talk to you again soon. Bye for now.